Hi, my name is Karen Cardiel. I'm Deputy Editor at Cell, and we're here at the 79th Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is cognition, and I'm very privileged to be speaking with Susumu Tanagawa of the Riken MIT Center at MIT. Yes. Thanks for joining us. Sure, welcome. Uh, so, much of your recent work has yeah. been focused on memory, and in particular, yeah. trying to understand more about memory engrams. Right. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, memory research had a fairly long history, okay? However, there was a general idea that if you store a bit of memory in your brain network, there must be somewhere in the brain the cells and also cell network must have been altered, you know, biochemical or biophysical ways, and that, that all, those alterations must last for a certain period of time, which may correspond to the length of the memory. Okay, so that idea has been around uh, many years, but uh, nobody until recently nobody has uh, pinpointed where exactly a particular memory information is stored. And uh, it's been difficult. Uh, you know, there are the, uh, the fragmentary uh, findings, uh, quite a bit of them uh, exist in the literature, like a synaptic plasticity, you know, the synapse strength of the, uh, the uh, uh, is altered or strengthened. But nobody has shown which cell, in which cell in, in, in the animal or in humans, uh, actually have those synapses the strength. So, so you, we want to identify the population of cells in the brain, presumably clustered somewhere, not necessarily spread out in the entire brain network, uh, to identify those cells uh, which, uh, in which these ch presumed changes have occurred. Mm -hmm. okay? And uh, not only that, if you want to prove those cells have something to do with a particular memory, mm -hmm. uh, after you identify those cells, uh, you have to show those cells are responsible for the recall of that particular memory, mm -hmm. right? So idea is, conceptually, idea is when you form a memory, certain cells, population of cells get activated, mm -hmm. okay? neurons get activated. And then subsequently, like a day later, mm -hmm. if you go to those cells and activate them, then animals should feel they are recording that memory. All right? So that's the requirement. But uh, it's been very difficult to do this until uh, about two, two or three years ago, where the, uh, the, the technology called optogenetics uh, allowed us to uh, uh, I label those cells, label or tag, tag, tag those cells, and using optic uh, manipulations, uh, be able to subsequently be able to uh, activate those, uh, reactivate those cells, and to see whether animal really behave as if uh, they recall the memory. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's what we did about two years ago, okay? and this opened up. Uh, for the first time, you can actually see under the microscope the cells, uh, which is holding information. Okay, and uh, we have a trick to uh, let those cells uh, fluoresce. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see the green cell in the microscope, not a single cell, population of cell in the particular area of the brain called the hippocampus, mm -hmm. uh, which lights up, and those are the cells. Uh, which carry the information because if we reactivate those cells uh, with optic fiber implanted into the brain deep inside the hippocampus, then animal behave as if they are recording a memory. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's what uh, been, uh, we've been involved. And then after, after that kind of discovery is made, the whole field of uh, whole questions of uh, um, memory-related uh, issues uh, can be readdressed, mm -hmm. specifically uh, focusing on those cells, okay? In the past, we believed there are cells like that must exist, for instance, in the hippocampus, 
but the hippocampus is a very uh, heterogeneous population of cells with different areas and different types of cells and different connections and so on. So we were looking at before at very average pictures. And now we can really look at the cells which carry memory, very, uh, memory, uh, the memory information and uh, uh, we can manipulate them with the optogenetics and make uh, animal uh, memorize or uh, stabilize the memory, uh, consolidate the memory, and uh, there are other, uh, like a recall memory and all those things. And you can also combine this with, uh, for instance, uh, emotion. Emotion had very much to do with the memory. You know, nice experience I had, a terrible experience I had. So those, uh, uh, those kind of memory are uh, all uh, linked to uh, the, the circuit or brain circuit which control emotion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is not only done by hippocampus. And so our recent work showed that uh, another area was invoked invo invo to this called amygdala. Mm -hmm. So hippocampus amygdala amygdala interaction allow us to form a memory of a different we call it a valence, mm -hmm. different uh, emotional uh, value. And then you can also uh, manipulate those. For instance, I don't mean to say that uh, we can do this quickly in human, but because these are animal studies. Nevertheless, in human, uh, psychiatrists uh, treat you know, something called a psych psychotherapy. Okay? So depressed patient consult with a psychiatrist. What the psychiatrist does, do, uh, which works in a pretty good proportion of depressed patients, is that to let the person recall nice, pleasurable experience they have had in their life. It turns out that depressed people, the, the nice experience, memory, uh, recall is suppressed. Okay, that's why they are they are depressed. Okay, everybody had a nice experience, a bad experience in, the, in their life, mm -hmm. but depressed patients uh, usually often have only bad memory. Okay, and their good memory uh, probably there. Mm -hmm. Memory held for pleasurable experience is there, but their expression apparently is blocked. Okay, but they don't know that. But the empirically, psychiatrist psychiatrist knows if you help the patient mm -hmm. to recall some nice memory they had, apparently their symptom is reduced for some people, and it not only reduced just for short time period, but there are several months, maybe years, it helps. Okay, so that's known, mm -hmm. but uh, how? Uh, wh where in the brain uh, this interaction is going on with the, the, the pressure memory and uh, uh, fear memory or anxiety memory, very little is known. So we were, our most recent work is um, um, something to do with uh, understanding the circuit, mm -hmm. circuit for uh, pressure memory and the fear memory and uh, try to understand uh, how one could uh, manipulate, one could manipulate in mouse mm -hmm. uh, in such a way that uh, when you have both memories in, 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 in the brain, in the brain, how can you manipulate in such a way that uh, the uh, positive memory will become more dominant? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you mentioned that there were two brain areas involved yeah. in the memory. The we talked about the hippocampus and, and the amygdala. amygdala. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. so what's your current interpretation of yeah. the functional differences between right. those in terms of memory? So coding? hippocampus actually had nothing to do with emotion. Hippocampus network, but we did very well studied, actually have something to do with the uh, environment. So con we call it the context, mm -hmm. okay? So if you are here for the first time, Cosping Harbor campus, uh, you learn something about this campus environment. Okay. One year later, 
you come here again and you you feel oh I've been here before that's because he you had a contextual memory of this context mm -hmm. so hippocampus is the primary function of hippocampus primary not exclusive function mm -hmm. primary function of hippocampus is to memorize to store information about environment context mm -hmm. nothing to do with emotional value mm -hmm. amygdala on the other hand is a uh, uh, one which uh, can uh, encode both nice memory and the terrible memory, both, mm -hmm. both sides, plus and the minus. Mm -hmm. okay. But hippocampus and amygdala are connected. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, if you think about it, uh, something nice you had always has environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, you go to vacation and you had a great time, and when you recall it later, you vividly remember uh, how the beach was like and uh, how the sky was like and all this environment is always there. Mm -hmm. The bad memory is also the same. The PTSD is an extreme case where you had a terrible experience somewhere and you remember. A mm -hmm. um, problem of the, for these people is that they, they recall this too easily mm -hmm. by, uh, be, uh, by encountering some unrelated things, but there are some kind of similarity they detect. Mm -hmm. And then they, they suffer because because they recall this terrible, terrible, terrible experience. That also has an environment. So always, they are, we call this episodic memory, memory of episodes. Mm -hmm. So episode comes with a valence, positive and negative variance of a different extent. Okay? So hippocampus is involved for, uh, in, in, in uh, episodic memory. And then uh, amygdala will add the valence to, to the memory of episode. Mm -hmm. okay. So obviously there are interactions between them. And uh, um, we want, so you can give the, to the same mouse, same mouse, uh, both memories, okay, in a certain order. Mm -hmm. Terrible one first, and a nice one next, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So you can give them a bad memory, and then uh, later you give a good memory, and you ask, what happened to that bad memory? Okay. Now this we can now do by uh, lo what we call longitudinal experiment mm -hmm. within subject experiment by uh, by manipulating this uh, memory engram not only in amygdala but also in the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what we are finding is uh, some circuit which is crucial uh, in uh, in switching of uh, uh, dominant memory, uh, positive or negative. So I think, uh, th uh, yeah, we we want to extend this to uh, uh, to the to animals, which are uh, highly uh, cho chronically stressed. Mm -hmm. You know, often the chronic stress lead to uh, lead to depression. Yeah. Okay. So now we have to we are making the mouse model of depression, human depression, uh, which is induced by chronic stress. Uh, to understand if there's a suppression of the nice well, there are, it's there's more difficult to switch? Or? Yeah, I, I cannot tell you the, the final result because it's completely uh, unpublished. But the point is, we can manipulate. We can manipulate the uh, emotional state of mouth, okay, by uh, by this type of experiment, by combining the ba the stress and the depressed state uh, and some uh, very nice experience or something like that in different order, you deliver that to the mouse, and the mouth mouth shows effect of pressure memory. Well, I look forward to seeing those results in the future. Yeah, Thanks right. so much for You're joining welcome. us.